will tell us about Num Cosmo, a numerical cosmology library. So hello, I'm going to talk about the Merco Cosmology Library. This is a project that uh, we are developing for a few years uh, right now. And uh, I developed the most, uh, the infrastructure part of the, uh, the library. Mariana here uh, developed the LSS part and Sihil Du, uh, the uh, cross correlation part of the library. So in this talk, I will try to explain a little bit how we solve the problem of uh, pipeline building in this kind of cosmology, numerical cosmology problems. Because it's not trivial when you try to make things modular, or when you try to put different models in your, in your uh, um, toolbox, you start to have a, a very uh, a large number of complications in the, in the code itself. So we try some, some different approach here to, to make this uh, uh, pipeline building uh, much uh, easier. So, Initially, we have um, a free software written in C. It's uh, published by the, uh, using the GPL license, license. It's online, you can, you can access it wherever you want. We have a continuous integration to check the, the, the commits. And we divide the codes uh, in two main modules. The first one is, some, is everything that's not related specifically to cosmology or, or astrophysics. And the second one, second one is built on top of this one, of course, and has the implementations that are related to cosmology and, and astrophysics. Here we choose a different technology that is the, this framework written by the, the Genome people, the, not Genome people, but the people from the Genome project that uh, wrote this glib uh, and G-object framework that you can use uh, object-oriented programming C without uh, having the, the burdens of uh, the, the slowness that you can have when you write this kind of coding in C++, for example. <clears throat> Not much better. Sorry? No, no, no. It's too faint, I think, but that's okay. So, <clears throat> So this gives you the, 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 the flexibility of object-oriented programming without the, the, the slowness that you can have when you do this in C++ or Python or anything like this. But you have an additional uh, good here that is the G-object introspection. So you, you just need to write your code in C and you follow certain rules. And in the end, you have not only your library written in C, but you also have the, the, the bindings automatically written for Python per... Oh, much better. <clears throat> Python per and a lot of other different languages for free. So you don't need to write a, a single line in Python or Perl or Java to have your bindings uh, ready from your library in C. And then an additional nice thing about this framework is that uh, you can even write objects in Python on top of objects wrote in C. So you can extend the library in, in other languages. And finally, <clears throat> we implemented a serialization framework that's essential for this kind of uh, complex analysis because sometimes you need to, to get something that's uh, on the uh, comp computer memory and you want to save to disk and restart that later. And have a complex uh, web of objects and uh, initialization matrix, and you have to have a way to save this to file or send it to, through the network so you can load in a, in a slave node that's going to do some work for you. So this is the basic uh, computer uh, science part of the, the, the code. So 
everything that's related to Nucos math is under the prefix NCM and the rest is under the prefix NC. So to build a pipeline, you basically want to have models that basically uh, representations of something physical that has parameters. And in the end, you want to combine these models in a model set. Because in, you don't want to, to, to write a single model that uh, is going to mix together cosmology, astrophysics, and other parameters that can come from instruments or other things. You, you want to, to, to split them out in concise models. And then you can combine it when you need it uh, through a model set. In the same, in the same way, you have uh, the data that basically represents one single likelihood. So one single likelihood that has all the, its uh, necessary correlation between all the data points, you're going to put inside of a NC, uh, NCM data uh, object. And you have a set of them to build your combined probes or uh, whatever you want. <clears throat> and then you use these two, uh, these two concepts of model set and data set to build your likelihood and then your fit object. Your fit object here is, the, the name is fit, but you, you can actually use fit objects for MCMC, MC, and a lot of different uh, statistical analysis. <clears throat> so I try to explain by an example how the, the pipeline building is done here. So usually people start building pipelines by thinking in the most uh, basic cosmological uh, uh, observables that need to be computed. So they start by uh, background and distance, and then they put the perturbations in, on top of that. Then, then they put some kind of uh, nonlinear approximation or fitting formula to build the, 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 the final power spectrum, for example. So, but if you want to change now the, the, the basic cosmological uh, ob um, model, you have to now, or, or you, you rewrite your pipeline, or you create some branching that's going to choose which uh, uh, cosmological model to be used. And this kind of branching starts to complicate very quickly because you, you, if you have four options here and 10 options there, you have like an exponential growth of options going on in your code and you have to keep track of which option you choose uh, for to, to use as, as a background model to give uh, the, the right options on the perturbation module and so on and so forth. So instead of doing this kind of bottom up build of the pipeline, here we try to do something top down. So if you think you want, in the end, to compute some number that's the likelihood, and this likelihood needs to compute all the sub-likelihoods that you have uh, below it. So these likelihoods, they have inside of them the, the requirements, the model that it, they require to compute their observables. So this likelihood, for instance, it's a likelihood that is, is written on top of the data uh, gauss cov that's a, a general object for a Gaussian distributed data when you know the covariance, not the inverse of the covariance. Because when you know the inverse, you can, you can use it to be a little bit uh, computationally quicker. And on top of this object, there is this data supernova covariance uh, object. This, ob this object here needs a model like this to compute the, the mean and the covariance. So it calls this object here and is, this object calls all the, the necessary requirements for it. So it calls the distance model, and the distance model calls then the, 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 the cosmological model. Both of, of them are inside of an M set, and the M set is then um, charged with the new values of parameters from the MCMC or the best fit finder, or whatever you are, you are doing with your, your likelihood. <clears throat> so in this example, we have um, the fit model requires a new set of parameters to be computed, the, the, the new, new set of cosmological parameters to compute the observables. Then both models are updated, so we have a key that controls uh, which uh, controls which set of parameters are prepared by the, these computational objects. So here they update both uh, objects, and then we have the update done by distance and then by this object here of the covariance, the distance itself, the parameters uh, related to luminosity, uh, stretch and color, uh, the, the absolute magnitude, the H naught, and so on and so forth. Then this is 
given back to the likelihood that, that computes the numbers and the number going back to the MCMC sampler that's going to choose the next point or, 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 or other uh, scheme like this. So here we have a pipeline that's built from uh, top down. So the, the final requirement that's what you actually want to compute calls uh, only the necessary steps behind it that uh, I need to compute the final, the, your final number. <clears throat> So, for instance, let's say that we don't want to vary some uh, the the the, cosmolo the the supernova uh, model uh, parameters. So, in this case, the M set uh, is updated only the, the the cosmological parameters, and then only the distance will be uh, recomputed. So, so just these two quantities here are being recomputed. So, for instance, this model that we're going to make a uh, Sholensky decomposition of this matrix, you will not do the, the, the Sholensky decomposition again. So, you have a, a very different pipeline here that if you want to, to do the same kind of analysis in a, in a usual way, you're going to have to rewrite your pipeline to see if in this case I want to recompute this part of the, likelihood, the, of the likelihood or not, and then you have to control it by branching, which can be very complicated. And this, uh, in, in here, this happens naturally. Okay, <clears throat> this is a simple case. Now, a, a little bit more involved case would be super uh, uh, sim B temperature only plus BAO. So, here we can see another feature of the library. We have inside of the model set we have both uh, plant likelihood and uh, a simple BAO uh, average uh, volume uh, likelihood. So, this, let's say that when you build your object, you put this uh, uh, likelihood first. Then, when, when going to compute the, the final number, the likelihood, it's going to call this likelihood here. This likelihood requires the distance. So, it's going to, be, it's going to call this object to prepare itself with the current model parameters here. Okay, then this distance is prepared, and the, the numbers are... are uh, uh, get, we get the numbers from it and put in the likelihood here. Then the second likelihood is called, and then the Boltzmann uh, uh, module is, is going to be it's going to compute the, the, the anisotropies, but it requires a lot of different things to, comp to compute it. Let's say that the first thing that it calls it's a distance. Then the model, the distance object is called again, but now it knows that it is already prepared for this set of parameters, so it does not prepare it again. So in this way, we don't need to branch. We just need to put inside of the likelihood what you want to compute, and then only the things that are going to be needed are going to be computed in the order of necessity. Okay, so to, build, to compute the, the, the evolution of your Boltzmann uh, equations, you need the recombination, and then you have here uh, the object for recombination. The models necessary, necessary for these are the, the background model, the primordial power spectrum model, the ionization model, and the Planck foreground and instruments model. So, uh, in this case, we, we, we need all these models to compute just the, 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 our likelihood, and we split here the, the, the parameters uh, like this. The, the most difficult part of this kind of uh, breaking down of your computation is to understand which are the right places to, broke, to break your, your code. Because you, you have to build here abstract interfaces. Because, for instance, here I have a dark energy uh, like modeled model by a simple equation of state, constant equation of state. But in the end, it has to communicate with this, mod, this object here through an abstract interface that every homogeneous isotropic cosmology model has to have. So we have to identify what are, which are these this common interfaces that, that you build um, uh, to, to represent a cosmological model, a primordial power spectrum, a primordial cosmology model, a ionization model, et, et cetera. <clears throat> so here is a little zoom at this part of the code. We have, uh, as a backend class and CAM, but we also have our own Boltzmann uh, uh, equations uh, evolver here. It's, uh, it's much more complicated because here, well, it's more complicated for me, but in the end, I hope to be more simple, simpler 
simpler for people to, to use. Because uh, here we, we made a huge effort to try to break down the, the whole uh, Boltzmann hierarchy pro, uh, equations in different models. So you can just change, for instance, let's say, here is the component that uh, describes the photon baryon uh, plasma. So you can just change this component. You don't have to, to, to care about how you describe your, your, your neutrinos or the perturbations in your dark energy component. So uh, it's, it's a complicated business because all these uh, components here have dynamical variables that need to be evolved in this same set of uh, uh, ordinary uh, differential equation sets. And that's, in the end, controlled by this object here. And we have two main problems. That's the tight coupling phase that is usually solved by going for higher time derivatives. When you go for higher time derivatives in this kind of process, you increase the coupling between variables. So in the end, if you go to second or third deriv time derivatives, you couple all the components, all the components. So it's almost impossible to compute, for instance, the initial conditions modularly, because here it's going, everything is going to be coupled. So instead of doing this kind of solution through this uh, uh, syntopic series in the, the time derivatives, we solve it by making a smart change of variables that uh, allows you to compute at least the, mono, the monopole and the dipole uh, independently of the, 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 the specific characteristics of your component. And then we can make a, we make a, a recurrence uh, uh, approach, so we can compute the monopole and dipole uh, generally, and go give back to the bob to the, the components, and then components give the, the next order so, uh, uh, part of the solution, so on so forth. So you can compute the initial condition here. And uh, beyond the, um, the tight coupling, you have the the problem of the. The, the Jacobian of this iteration can be very complicated, so you need to know which variables couple with each variable so you can reorder your, uh, your vector of functions in order to have a bounded uh, matrix of, uh, of, for Jacobian in evolution of the, the ODEs. So it's very quickly, uh, I spoke very quickly about this, not too much uh, detail, but it's, uh, we hope to have a final version of this online in the next probably three or four months. So to, to test the quality of the library, you have several different steps here. First, we, we try to make unit testing for every different model. So we have to, we know that each one of them are working correctly, independently. Uh, another thing that we saw a lot of people having problems was this uh, not consistent set of fundamental physical uh, variables, con constants, and here we took care to, to, to get the final and the, the best uh, sets of variables that we can combine to, to, to compute the, all the, the physical things in, in the library. Another thing that people, um, for instance, if you go to take a look at class, you're going to see that you have a lot of different parameters controlling the precision because the, you control in the end the number of knots in the interpolation of some functions. And this is very hard to, to, to know uh, the relationship between the number of knots you put in an interpolation and the final precision that you have for your interpolation error. So we have some, uh, some objects to, that try to deal with this problem, trying to find the best number of knots and the, the, the position of the knots in order to have the, the, the interpolation error smaller than a, a, a certain requirement. Uh, everything is built on top of auto tools that are the, 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 the usual tools done by the Linux people for um, building and, 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 and distributing sort, uh, code. Uh, we try to make some packages for, pack, for, for different package managers, managers, but in the end, the only up to date is the Conda Forge because it's the, 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 the one that people actually are, are using. We, as I said before, we, uh, we use the Travis CI for continuous integration. And here, another thing that we try to do a little bit differently, it's not reinventing the wheel. I know that's hard because people has, have a lot of problems trying to install the library because they have to install all these prerequisites. But in the end, we, we think that's better like this because uh, in, I, I will not be able to, to, to give support for Noon Cosmo and also for all these kind of different numerical tools that are available elsewhere. 
So just giving a, a, a resume of what we have for SIMB, we have the Planck likelihoods are already integrated inside of the library, so you don't have to build it uh, additionally. When you, you, you build new Cosmo, you have already the, 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 the likelihood, uh, the Planck likelihood on top uh, inside of it. We have a version of class in it, a little bit modified, so we can glue together with all these models for new Cosmo models. We have the, uh, the, the models uh, required to compute the likelihood for Planck. Uh, we have class as a backend. We have an, an additional backend for CAMB, but it's not so well tested as the, our class backend. And we have also our own implementation of the Boltzmann code here. <clears throat> so for example, uh, uh, in this kind of changing the pipeline, you can think that you can simply change, for instance, the, the primordial model uh, by putting something different from a simple power law. This is uh, the models that were tested by the Planck team to see if there is some kind of uh, primordial modification that can make your, you know, your primordial uh, power spectrum in order to fit better the low L parts of the TT at CMB. So we try a different uh, set of models here, and we have this implementation. So it's very simple. You have the same analysis for a power law. You just change one object, and you have a different. Uh, you have analysis for this kind of modification. We have a re-implementation of RecFast, it, a little bit different from the original one because we, here we don't need to make this segmented evolution, and then they make some kind of smoothing between the solu one solution and another. Here we do everything in a single pass. Uh, we have, the, our, of course, the, the power spectrum, all the, the, the necessary products from the, same, from the Boltzmann computation available through this kind of object. And we have an implementation also of ALFIT. So this is just a very simple example. Uh, here we're just building the, the, transfer, uh, uh, the, the power spectrum through transfer functions in Eisenstein who, or the, 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 everything got directly from class. Uh, this is just showing the difference between using Eisenstein who and class, and of course you, you cannot use it nowadays, Eisenstein who. Um, uh, just showing the difference when you put ALFIT or not, what kind of modifications you get, what each scale. So what would be the difference in sigma eight when you compute like using these uh, different uh, um, models. And here uh, it's another object that we have in, in Cosmo that is a power spec filter. It's a general uh, code for mathematical code that applies filters like this. So here you can have any kind of a special function that you, that you need. And, and if you know to, how to compute this function times a polynomial from zero to infinity, then you can use this uh, object very, in a very simple manner to compute the, 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 this kind of filtering for any kind of uh, power spectrum. This gives you already the, 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 the final result as a function of R and Z. So it gives you an interpolation, a uh, two-dimensional interpolation of this function here. So you can compute, for instance, the sigma of R as a function of Z and R. So now trying to compare a little bit what you have in, in NuCosmo and what you have available elsewhere. We have this, uh, these codes. Uh, nowadays, we have an additional code like CCL, but uh, uh, we had only uh, before CAMP and CLASS. And these uh, here are the things that we have. You can find both in CAMP and CLASS and in Cosmo. And things with stars are the things that you can only find in Cosmo. So for example, here, we have a model for dark energy, a, a, mod, a general model, a, a set of models for implementing dark energy in different fashion. And also we have uh, a simple implementation of the background where you just make a kinematic approach and you model the, 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 the metric directly without uh, going to, to define your, your gravitational model. Uh, here we have the simple power law that uh, everyone uses, but we have also have different models that can model your, your primordial epoch in a different manner. We have here only the, the same scheme from, from CAM to model ionization. We have the different, uh, different uh, recombination model here. For uh, Boltzmann codes, we have the class backend. We have our, our own that, our own that has, are being developed right now. We have all these products that come from the Boltzmann. 
And here it's the part that related to Cosmic C and Monty Python. Uh, for, uh, it's the, 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 the codes that related to the, the statistical part or the, in the likelihood. So we have the, the data, the, the, the uh, supernova data with covariance that is built on top of this object. We have the simp simple one that has, has not covariance that's written on top of this object. So it's just an example that uh, you can write uh, a likelihood in a very simple manner by simply simply extending an object that already does their hard part. For instance, here, if you build the, the covariance for supernova, you don't need to, to, to take care of the, all the details about the composition of matrix whenever. You just give this, the, the father object, the, the matrix and the mean, and it does the, the rest for you. And here we have the, 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 the work by Sihil that made this nice code for cross-correlation data. So we can build a generic, key, generic cross-correlation uh, likelihoods on top of this general framework here. We have a lot of different tools for Bayesian analysis and frequency analysis. For instance, we have the usual metropolis hastings sampler, but you can just change the transition kernel and do a different thing. We also have the ensemble sampler that instead of using just one point of the parametric space to, to, to build your chain, use a sample of points and then now you uh, uh, part of your chain is a sample of the, the posterior. So the, this is was introduced by these people that wrote MCE and they introduced this stretch step, the stretch walker that make, uh, they had nice properties but it's not very uh, uh, nice for high dimensionality. And that's why we are, we are testing a new uh, sample that's based on the, an approximation that you built from your uh, posterior using half of your, of, of your so you can make something more close uh, no correlated steps between the chains. Everything that's, uh, that's uh, all the products go to a catalog, that's a common interface for everything, and this catalog can be analyzed by this generic, uh, can be used for output from an MCMC or SMCMC or a simple MCMC. We have a general framework for Bayesian computation, uh, approximate Bayesian computation also, that when you don't know or it's too expensive to compute your likelihood. And we have some nice frequentist analysis tools uh, that you can compute the error and the, 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 the 2D uh, confidence regions using just frequentist uh, analysis. Uh, in the, we also have best feed fighters. Now you can find them in, in, in Monty Python, Cosmic C, but you don't have many options. And this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, analysis usually depends a lot of, on the quality of your uh, minimization algorithm. So it's nice to have a lot of options. This library here provides almost, I think, 20 or 30 different algorithms for minimization, both local and global. And it's nice to have uh, a, a tool like this because you can have, you can find it a little bit different values for your best fit when you use a, a proper minimization algorithm. We have a, a generic um, framework for Fisher matrix, both the observed Fisher matrix and the expected Fisher matrix that are built on top of the generic differentiation, numerical differentiation object. Uh, we have the usual Monte Carlo, not MCMC, but MC. And this, uh, this is something that we tried a long time ago, but we never finished, so it's like, trying to do a mount color, but instead of sampling from your, your, your likelihood, you just bootstrap from it. This is an example of the output you have from running IMCMC, for example, you have a lot of different uh, diagnostics about your convergence, the, the acceptance ratio, it's just, just an example of this. And in, the output can be used, by, it can be analyzed by some uh, tools. You can just run a simple uh, Python script to generate a, a corner plot with everything, uh, the symbols and the, all, all the, the, the ranges. Uh, this is another kind of tool to evaluate the evolution, the evolution of your chains. Here you can see clearly that they are, they are still evolving. We get all the, the cosmological parameters and we just normalize them by the current uh, uh, estimation of the standard deviation and the, we subtract the mean. So we can analyze how all these parameters are together uh, doing in your, in your uh, MCMC. So you see some parameters are quite nice here, uh, uh, fluctuating between 
minus two and two, or, or to have some parameters that are just going, uh, evolving. So you are, we are, we are away from mixing here. And since you have this ensemble samples, it's nice that you can just evaluate the distribution of your posterior time to time. So here's just the number of iterations of your ESMCMC. And here you, go, you see how the posterior is distributed. So this, in this direction here, we have the, the, the probability distribution. And here, time of, the, of your evolution. So initially, all the dots, all the, your ensemble is much uh, more concentrated than they should be, and then they evolve to the right distribution here. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so any questions for Sandro? Actually, actually we, we have using the, the non-COSMO in, in EP for the students uh, in, in many opportunities. Uh, my question is the, the following. Uh, uh, what are the original sources for each code? Do, do you use uh, numerical recipes or you, mm. did you program all the, the, the codes you? Yeah, yeah. most of it. One, one yeah. by one. Okay. We have the, the, this, the, this, this prerequisites. So the audio, uh, ODE codes are just some iOS libraries. So the libraries are there okay. because uh, we have uh, 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 other algorithms that we got from other sources, but the, the license is there, so you can find it. But everything that's uh, inside of like NCM something or NC something, it was uh, computer, uh, programmed by me, Mariana, or Sihil. Okay, and uh, you have uh, you know you have some some mechanism to know. Uh, how much the users are doing uh, MPI, OMP, MP uh, parallelization of the, those codes? Uh, there is need uh, up to now. The, you don't need to parallelize the applications. Uh, there is any our code is, 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 is currently completely parallelized on both threads and MPI. Okay, you can but choose it. But I, 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 I don't know if I have uh, how to know if people are using it. I, I like am. in this so, way, right? Yeah, uh, it would be interesting to know. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, quickly, a related question. So it's super impressive what you guys put together. Um, so with the CCL, somebody was giving a talk saying that they had always at least two codes to compare and make sure that they gave. The, how did you validate that everything is, is um, working correctly? We, we, we do the same thing, but just for with one code right now, that's class. So the class also computes the background, everything, the perturbations. So we have a module to compare the output of class and non-cosmo. And we, do, we did this by hand with CAM. So, and it's our, in our, in our uh, project to do an incorporation of CCL inside of non-cosmo. So we can have some kind of NEC, uh, Cosmo, CCL that's going to use CCL as backend. So if people want to know that their code is already validated, they can use this kind of models based on CCL. Of course. And also, another thing that uh, we want, comparing, for example, having the CCL backend, is that the user can even compare the, um, the time to compute, compute and choose the optimal one. So you will have this comparison, uh, make sure that uh, the codes are compatible and everything is okay. And even because of for now, uh, most of the CCL functions have some um, precision to Fafra other. I have been discussed uh, uh, with you. And some, uh, some quantities, we believe that we have uh, more precise functions. So it's something that we would like to contribute and improve uh, both, both non-Cosmo and CCL. So it's, uh, yeah. Okay, so let's thank Sandro again. There's a coffee break. We are back in half an hour. Less, less than half an hour.
Portado, yes. Okay, so welcome back, everyone. Now we have Antonino Proilla, who will tell us about non gaussian likelihood and what one expects. Okay. Hello, good afternoon to Ox, yes. So let me thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. It's just an accident that he is also my boss, <laughs> but okay. I will talk, I'm Antonio Troia, postdoc here in Sao Paulo, as you, as you can understand from my accent, I'm really Brazilian. And I will talk about non-Gaussian likelihood in harmonic space. That is why we don't need covariance matrix to estimate cosmological parameters. Everything you have to know and you have to take home from this talk is in the Dido. So we are talking about likelihood, so Bayesian statistics. We are talking about non Gaussian, so not the likelihood that we are used to uh, work with. Uh, and especially, we are talking about harmonic space. So everything I will say from now on is related to the space, to the Fourier space, to, uh, related to the, sp the spherical framework. And in the subtitle, you, you can see what, what is the main uh, uh, purpose of this talk. Show you that we don't need a covariance matrix to uh, estimate parameters. Uh, just a bit just a note before starting, uh, as I said, my surname is Troia. So please, if you receive an email from me, you can open it. It's not a virus. <laughs> so let's do a Bayes theorem 101 class. We have here the Bayes theorem. The posterior is the probability of A being true, uh, given that B is true. And we can write this probability as the product of the likelihood, that is the probability that B is true given A, the prior, the probability of A being true, and the evidence, the probability of B being true. Usually we set this uniform, this is equal to one, and uh, what we want is that our model uh, is to find the model that best fit the data. So we want that the probability that the model we are using uh, is the model given the data is uh, the, maximum, the maximum as possible. So what do we want to do is maximize the posterior, the posterior. In order to do this, we have to maximize the likelihood. Maximize the likelihood is our priority. And this is important to, to say and to see it as large as possible. Uh, usually, uh, we, use, uh, we are used to work with Gaussian likelihood where we consider a data uh, where our statistic, that can be the power spectrum or everything else, is uh, subtracted to the, the, the model, that is the statistic evaluated having fixed some parameters. And uh, we evaluate uh, the square of this data vector divided by the covariance matrix. Uh, this covariance matrix is a n, n times n uh, dimensional, and the process of inverting it sometimes could result in a bottleneck in our analysis. So the, the, the path that going from data to parameter estimation has some bottleneck. For example, the time for the telegons, the time for the conference, and the evaluation of the covariance. Uh, what we want to do is understand why covariance is a bottleneck. For example, uh, if we want to evaluate the covariance numerically, we need a lot, of, a lot number of mocks, a huge number of mocks, in order to have a convergent covariance matrix. This uh, is translated in a lot of computational error, uh, effort, so especially in memory and especially in time. So we need a lot of time to compute the mocks, and then we can finally have the the, the covariance matrix. We can try to, uh, uh, to do a, an, analytical, uh, an analytical covariance matrix, but it's always important to put the correct uh, uh, systematics in it in order to have the, the covariance as uh, real as possible. 
let's do a little digression in my talk. I want to show you an idea of Oliver Friedrich that we are using here at, uh, at in our research group in order to validate uh, covariance matrix. Because maybe you can uh, you can write a covariance matrix is as diagonal as possible and everything, but maybe it's not uh, as, as true as we want. So the idea is to validate using uh, the, the mo using mocks. Uh, we know that the logarithm of a Gaussian should be have like a key square distribution. In terms of mocks, we can write the exponential of the, the argument of the exponential in the Gaussian. Instead of using the, uh, a model, we can use the mocks is, itself. So we have the statistic evaluated at the mock i minus the statistic evaluated at the mock j uh, squared divided by the covariance, the usual covariance is multiplied by two. If you do some back envelope math, you can see that actually uh, tw uh, twice the, the, co the usual covariance using the data model with the, with the fixed cosmology is exactly the covariance that we need here. If we, are, uh, we show that this behave like a key squared, the, the game is done. And, uh, and we can say, okay, the, the covariance is good, we can do our analysis. Here is the result of uh, the covariance evaluated on some flask mocks of, uh, using the mask of uh, DSCR1 data. As you can see, the, the distribution of key squared in the x-axis and the number of, currents, of occurrences in the y-axis uh, perfectly are, are fitted for, uh, with a key square distribution with a key square reduced of uh, 1.01. So when we see this kind of plot, we can say, oh, look, our, uh, our covariance matrix, is, it works with, our, uh, with, our, with the mocks we want to use. So let's come back to the to the principal theme of this, of this talk, the, the fact that the covariance is a, a bottleneck. There's no way out. We have to evaluate the covariance. We have to spend time in, uh, in this. Unless our statistics don't follow Gaussian distribution. And this is what I saw you in the title. So now I will give you a spoiler of the talk. So please, if you, want, if you don't want to know how the talk ends, Close your eyes. <laughs> so, Darth Vader is, uh, sc sorry, I put the wrong spoiler. I put the wrong spoiler, sorry. The, the actual spoiler is that the CL are not Gaussian distributed. What? Yes, CLs are not Gaussian distributed. If we plot the distribution of CLs at low L, we can see that the histogram is not well fitted by a Gaussian. Here we try to fit the histogram using a Gaussian and we obtain a key squared of three. So this is something far from what we are used to, say, to, to see. But if we go to higher, C, to higher multiples, so for example 200, we can see that the, the distribution of the CL is well fitted by the Gaussian with a key squared of 1.1. Why? The, here we can see the definition of the CLs. The CLs are, let's say, just, let me pass this term, just the square of uh, the spherical harmonic coefficients. The spherical harmonic coefficients are Gaussian distributed. The square, we can see, again, with some back envelope math, that the square of uh, a gamma distributed uh, variable, random variable, behaves like a gamma distribution. In this case, the square of ALM is the CL. So while ALM be, uh, are uh, the, the point distribution, the probability distribution function of the ALM is a Gaussian, the one of the CL is not like this. But so far, we always used Gaussian likelihood for CLs, and no one complained. Why? In order to understand this, we have to, I have to tell you that actually the Gaussian distribution that, as I showed before, depends on two parameters, nu and beta, that I will tell you later what they are, 
behaves like a normal distribution with this mean and this variance when the parameter nu is greater than one. So what are these parameters nu and beta? Nu is related to the multiples. Beta is related to the, to the average CL. So what we are saying is that if we go to high, to high multiples, to, to high multiples, the our gamma distribution behave like a normal distribution with um, the average on the average of CL and the, and the variance on the square of the CL, exactly what we usually know. And this justifies what I showed you before, that uh, L equal to 20, the distribution is not Gaussian, but is well fitted by a, a, gamma, a gamma one. While I, uh, uh, L equal to 200, we can fit the distribution with a, with a Gaussian. The Gaussian likelihood is then justified at high multiples and extended to low multiple, usually, in the, in the analysis we do. But what happens if we use the correct probability distribution function to estimate parameters with CL? Oh, a wild likelihood appear. We can define a new likelihood. So it's 10 minutes that I talk, so let me sum up a bit what I said using a more charismatic person than me. So we are talking about CL, in particular, we are talking about low CL, low L, low multiple for the CL, where the distribution is such non-Gaussian, it is so gamma distributed, so wow, we have a new non-Gaussian likelihood for this. Okay, let's be serious. What's the shape of this new likelihood? <laughs> uh, let's start from, uh, from the, from the uh, definition of the gamma distribution. We said that the gamma distribution depends on two parameters and on the statistics. So this is the complete form of the gamma distribution. We have the one over the Euler gamma of the parameter nu, our statistic uh, uh, to the nu minus one divided by beta to the nu and the exponential of beta minus beta x. What are these two parameters? So uh, we say that nu is related to the multiple and beta is related to the, to the average of the CL. In particular, uh, we call nu the, degree of, the degrees of freedom of our CL at a certain multiple. And beta is just twice the average of the CL divided by uh, the degrees of freedom. Well, I put uh, DOF here because nu, uh, there's a lot of way to understand nu. What we did is parameterize nu in this way. So we consider per each L the number of modes of this L time F sky, that is the fraction of the sky you are uh, measuring, in which you are measuring uh, CL, uh, not masked, divided by L pix, that is a parameter, uh, it's actually the uh, square root of the area of the pixel this is the, the average number of galaxies, this is the, no, the total number of galaxies, and this is the area of the pixel divided, uh, that divides pi square in order to put it on a sphere, and L is kind of the multiple, the scale of this area, so the square root of the area. So we can write, as I said, the number of modes, the fraction of the sky, the multiple of the pixel, and this G effective. Now, this G effective is put here in order to uh, balance the effect of our mask and balance the effect of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the maximum multiple that we are, we are using. In fact, if we consider a full sky distribution where the pixelization is the highest as possible, we see that the nu, the number of degrees of freedom is just 12 plus one. So if the number of degrees of freedom is just 12 plus one, look, at uh, 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 large multiples, 
We have the, the gamma distribution for the statistic of CL is a normal distribution centered at the average of the CL with the variance of the CL, exactly what we know about the CL. So this is just to remark the fact that, okay, using a Gaussian likelihood is not a mistake, but there could be some impre imprecision when we deal with low, low multiples. Here we can see a plot, uh, the plot of our estimation of this G effective. In the x-axis, we have the, the multiple. In the y-axis, the, uh, the number of degrees of freedom of this multiple evaluated on the CLs using the, the fit of the, fitting the gamma distribution on the distribution of CLs. For a sky with a for a sky that is only four percent visible, with a, an L pixel equal to four, and we see that uh, the distribution of this G effective follow a straight line until more or less 1500s when it start to dump. This is probably because it's some effect of the pixel. What we of the pixelization of ilpix. This is used. This is uh, made using the the, 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 ilpix, the ilpix code in the ilpix framework. So what we have to to see is actually all the multiple that are consistent with the n side that we used, uh, and this is we can fit exactly with a straight line, which. Um, uh, slope is G effective, is equal to nine. And this is, uh, this value can be strange, but this is exactly uh, consistent with the values in, in literature. So we were started from the question, what's the shape of this new likelihood? The shape of this new likelihood is this. Okay, we just took the, the terms that are important in the, uh, in the process of maximizing this likelihood, we can see that we have two terms summed over all the multiples. The first term is the number of degrees of freedom times the logarithm of the, of our, of the uh, average of the CL, that in this case is our model, Why? plus the exponent that we saw uh, earlier. So the, 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 the product between our statistics, that is in case is our data, times our model. So here we have everything we need. We have our model, so we can fix a cosmology, evaluate the model, and this model is in beta, is stored in beta, and compare it with the data uh, that are stored in CL here. Have you not something uh, strange? I can give a candy for the one who understands. No There's no covariance matrix, <laughs> exactly. I will give I will owe you a candy. Uh, there's no covariance matrix needed. So in principle, we remove one of the of the bottlenecks. And we can do a likelihood uh, analysis, maximization, without evaluating the covariance matrix. Can I ask about that? So, the covariance here on these, these are the real covariances. The other is that the covariance is very close. So, this is to work on the Gaussian. It, this works like the Gaussian, yes. No, no, no. no. The field must be the Gaussian. The, the field? One. The, the LMs have to be Gaussian, of course. But in that case, I think that the covariance is the zero squared. It's not a zero squared. It's not a zero squared. In the case of the ALMs. Yeah, I'm getting confused about what the thing is. No, I understood your point, but uh, ah, this is what. To, uh, let's talk, uh, let's forget for a moment the, the non Gaussian, the idea of the gamma. And let's put uh, your question in a Gaussian framework. So yes, the, if everything is Gaussian, the covariance matrix is just the, the CS square. But we know that this is not Gaussian. What I was showing you is that we have some uh, random value, the ELMs, that should behave like a Gaussian. 
and this bring the CRs to, to, to behave like a, like, a, like a gamma. What happens if we have, for example, a non-Gaussian distribution, or if we have, for example, a, a masked sky, so the independence, the Gaussianity of the LMs is destroyed, we cannot say actually exactly what is the, the distribution of the, of, the, of the CLs. So this works exactly like the Gaussian case. It's kind of, a, uh, let me pass the term, it's kind of a null test. If everything works, if everything is Gaussian, we can estimate parameters with it. If this is not the case, we will find some bias. I don't know if this answers exactly your question, but the point is that Okay. Yes. No. Uh, or Gaussian estimation using the CL squared as covariance. Exactly. Yes. 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 You say, ah, because we here we are not considering the four point function. This is the point. This is a good question that, uh, in theoretically, we never discussed because we are starting this project in order to see what happens. But this is something that. Uh, we'll put in our to-do list to understand, I think. And uh, the face of Rogerio confirmed this. So, so yes, this is interesting. Uh, we will let you know as soon as possible. But the point is that in principle, in principle, if everything works as it should, this is, this is better than the, the, the Gaussian, the, the Gaussian uh, likelihood. Uh, okay, having said this, let's go to the application. Uh, cosmo we want to do cosmological parameter estimation, so we have to fix our cosmology, evaluate the power spectrum using this cosmology, project this power spectrum onto the CLs, estimate the likelihood, maximize this process, repeat MC, etc., etc., while we finally uh, are able to find the, the, para the cosmological parameter that fits our, our data. Here, you can see a preliminary, a preliminary uh, plot of the parameter estimation of omega cold dark matter and omega baryons. We can see that we were able to recover our parameters, and actually, this is preliminary for a lot of reasons, because our idea is to, uh, use, to perform this analysis using uh, the three times two point correlation function, uh, in harmonic space with the six parameters of the lambda CDM. So what we did was using just the galaxy the clustering and for a reduced, for a small number of, uh, of steps in the MCMC. But we are happy because with a, even with a small number of, uh, of repetition, we were able to, our, uh, our likelihood converged and we were able to find the, para the, the fiducial values. So this is something that is preliminary. This is something that will be enriched by uh, a better analysis that we hope will be, will be submitted in the, in the next future. Uh, let's speak about the future then. Uh, the next step, if all of, this all of this model works, the next step is uh, the real space analysis. How we pass from real space analysis. It is better. Because uh, evaluate the, the, the two-point correlation function in real space on the sphere is a bit complicated, let's say. Uh, always speaking about uh, computational uh, effort. But we can pass from the CLs that are easier to, to evaluate uh, because we know this easy relation, relation between the CL, the Legendre polynomial, and the correlation function on the sphere. So what we will do, the idea the, of our project is draw CL from the gamma distribution, evaluate the, uh, the two-point correlation function in real space using Legendre polynomials, add a shape noise 
with a Gaussian distribution, probability distribution, uh, centered in zero, of course, with a covariance that depends on the area of the sky that is seen, that we can see, of the number of, uh, of objects uh, average, uh, and the, the uh, with the width of the of the beam in theta that we are in uh, in theta the angle so the the real coordinate the coordinate in real space that we are going to 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 use. Okay, it's time to finish. So conclusions and perspective. Uh, the, the, let's start from the digression. Uh, we've developed a way to validate covariances, both for analytic and numeric ones, from an idea of Oliver. We developed a new non Gaussian likelihood for CL, uh, from, uh, and we estimate cosmological parameters. And uh, we, have, uh, we have to thank the work of uh, Elena Sellentin for, uh, for, uh, for all of this. That was the, the base on which. We are building our house. Uh, the future, the future we will apply, as I said, the non Gaussian likelihood for a three times two point analysis, first in harmonic space, then in real space. And we hope to, to show you something interesting that can enrich the, what, what we already know about the last case structure. Thank you for your attention. So, additional questions for Antonino? So, um, it was a nice talk, so thanks for that. I have a, uh, two technical questions, actually. The first one is that there are m two main reasons to use a gamma instead of a Gaussian. Mostly to d deal with always um, positive continuous variables and also to deal with the fact that you may have heterostasis assist in the data, or skewness close to zero, in your case, to low Ls. Mm -hmm. But there are also other alternatives, like invest Gaussian log normal. So the first question is, is there a theoretical reason for the gamma, or you're just trying to use a distribution that accounts for this problem in low Ls? Uh, there is a theoretical, I missed the word. Yeah, if there is a physical motivation, or it's more like I know the gamma deals better with skewness in low L, so you are just trying to use that? In this moment, uh, we are trying to use it, because we say, okay, let's try to go out from the scheme and see what happens if we uh, change our mind. So if we stop considering this as a Gaussian, what we consider is as it should be, so a gamma distribution. And there's another question that the, the concept of covariance only applies to a multinormal distribution. Yes. The gamma is univariate. Actually, the multivariate version is the inverse Richard distribution. Yes. So it seems to be it's like, I don't know if maybe I missed something, but it seems to be inconsistent to compare a gamma mm -hmm. against a multinormal because by definition, the gamma is univariate. So we shouldn't expect at all, like in the Gaussian we don't have a covariance as well, only the multinormal. Yes, we actually did this. This was a question uh, at the beginning. Uh, there is a way to connect them using the multi, the multivariate one. So I can I can show you later in case. But there is a we use the I don't remember the name the. The, the generate, with the generating function of the probability distribution, you can you can show that actually it makes sense. More questions for Antonino? Actually, it depends on the on the application you are. Uh, uh, this is regarding the the covariance metrics. Uh, for example, if you want to simulate a CMEB map, you for the field of pixelization, you need uh, the covariance matrix, even if you are simulating a non-Gaussian, for example. Okay. So it depends on the... If you are applying to real data, you mm -hmm. assume it, you don't need the, the covariance matrix, and you know previously that there's a non-Gaussian fluctuation, that's okay. But you are, if you are going 
to simulate a field, mm -hmm. you 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 cannot use this, you know. This is more or less the same uh, the same comment that Marco did. Uh, this is something that we we will see. Uh, uh, this is true. There is the four point correlation function is not depicted in our model. So the point is why. And this is a question we actually one 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 motivation to to do this talk was understand if there is something that we were underestimate. This was something we didn't estimate at all. So I can thank you, and we'll see what happens. We will show you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so from what I understood, uh, you showed the case for the full sky, right? The CL for the full sky? I showed the... the like the, the likelihood for the full sky. Yes. So yeah, I was thinking if that had, that uh, that's the reason why you don't have a kind of a covariance matrix, because uh, the CLs are uncorrelated in this case. Whereas if you had a partial sky, you would have correlation among the... No, wait. We, the, what you saw, the parameter estimation, was in a masked sky, was in a cat sky. I show you the full sky just to show you that you can relate the gamma distribution to a Gaussian distribution with the parameter you, that you know. But can you... Yes. Uh, to the likelihood? Uh, yeah, that... Okay, so yes, so well, I don't know. You, you kind of you are multiplying several independent likely likelihoods, yes. like like the probability for several yes. different CLs. Of course. So that's 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 the case if they are uncorrelated, right? Uh, yes, this is again. The, I think is the same question. Yeah. For the yes, the, in the sense that uh, this is what we are trying. This is the guess. Is our bet? Let's see what happens if we consider this. Okay. So the, the point is that all of uh, that you see is a work is an ongoing project. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to show you uh, the result, the, the the ultimate result. I'm here to show you. Look, we are doing this, and there are a lot of things that we don't know. Okay. But we hope that if this works, if we find an application to make it work. Maybe uh, we finally can do an analysis without covariance matrix and all the stuff related. And another thing is about the shot noise, let's say. So if you go back to the how you compute L peaks, yeah. So it seems there is no information regarding the... So the, the way you compute L peaks seems to be that it only matters the size of the pixel? Yes. So if you increase, if you decrease the density of objects, you don't have any impact on your measurement. Uh, if you decrease the density, you are decreasing also the number. In, in, yeah. With the same mask, you are also decreasing the number of objects. So this is the same. Right. So there is no impact on your. No. But I, I would imagine that should be there should be an impact on your likelihood, right? It's in this parameter. So ah. this is just a parameterization. There's nothing that say that actually the number of degrees of is this. So the way this G effective exists is to take in account all the factors that we are not taking account. Why we are saying that our degrees of freedom is related to the number of modes at a certain end. So this is just an easy way to see it, we can say. Okay. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we can thank Antonino again. Okay. <laughs> Don't forget about the Churrascaria tonight. <laughs>